Dang it. It's time now to select a crankshaft for the Texas XJS engine. And what I've done this morning is I've gone over to Crankshaft Corner and picked out the three most likely candidates for that engine. And I've done a preliminary clean on them and taken some measurements. And while they look the same, there are some differences. And we do have a winner, but it's not real obvious which one that is. Let's take a look at the first one here. Now the first one, is actually the one that is the most problematic. Now what's going to determine whether we use a crankshaft or not is the measurements of these things right here. And these are called journals. The ones that they, the crankshaft spins on inside of the crankcase are called main journals. They're all lined up along the center of the crankshaft and that's what they spin on. Center of the crankshaft runs through all of or the axes of rotation of the crankshaft runs through all of these. Then we got the crank pins, and that would be these right here. These are the ones that the connecting rods attach to. And in the case of this crankshaft, while it appears to be in reasonably good shape, there are some of these journals, uh, the crank pin journal, or I'm sorry, the main journals in particular, this one right here, the finish is kind of rough. You can run your fingernail over it and you can feel some pretty, pretty significant uh, roughness there. And a couple of the others are the same. Plus the fact that all of these journals are just a few ten thousandths of an inch smaller than they really ought to be. So what we can do right away is we can eliminate crankshaft number one. Crankshaft number two actually looks to be the best of the lot. If you look at these journals compared to the ones that were on crankshaft number one, crankshaft number two looks really, really good. And we, I measured these journals and they're all within specification. But this one doesn't make the cut either. And the reason is right here. Now this journal is the rear main journal. And the problem is that right here, this is where an old-fashioned rope seal lives. Now, this isn't a seal that works the same way as they would in your small block Chevy or Ford, you know, vintage engines from back in the day. Those you just sort of forced them into the block and they rested on the crankshaft and basically they, the seal wore in over time. This one, and I'm gonna show you how this works when I actually install a crankshaft in the engine. This rope seal, while it, you force it into the, the block and the main bearing cap, the way that you would uh, the ones I just mentioned, this actually has to be sized properly. If you just clamp it in there like you did with your old Ford and Chevy, this is what happens. Generates a huge amount of heat and what you can end up doing is knocking out the rear main bearing. And if might actually even be able to hear, eh, probably not, how rough this thing is. And you can see the blue color here and the blue color here. This got really, really hot back here. And uh, I don't recall taking a look at the bearings when we took this engine apart, but I would imagine that this bearing was pretty rough. So crankshaft number two didn't make the cut. Crankshaft number three, this one is the best of the lot simply because it, while it is on the edge of the minimum specification, the minimum size for all the journals, uh, they're all even, they're all very smooth as you can see, and um, this is what I would consider a good original standard size crankshaft. And we can see if we look at the back here, it doesn't suffer from that issue that the, that the uh, that crankshaft number two did. Uh, that rear main journal looks really good. So crankshaft number three is the winner. These other two, these aren't junk. What I'm gonna do is we're going to have these ground 10,000 under 
size and I've already got 10,000 undersized bearings for them and we will be offering those for sale on the Jaguar Preserve website sometime before the end of the year uh, for those of you who wish to rebuild your own engines. Oh, one really important thing. If you choose to have a local shop regrind your crankshaft, this is critical. These crankshafts, while they're forged steel, they're also hardened or nitrided. And what that means is that when these things were ground at the factory, they were then put in a pressure vessel in a nitrogen atmosphere, heated up and under pressure, um, the nitrogen hardens the entire outside of the crankshaft. If you have these things reground, you must, you must have them rehardened, nitrided. And if you don't have a shop in your area that'll do that, you've got no choice because these things will break. They're massive. They've got main journals. These things right here are the same size as a Ford 460 cubic inch engine, truck engine. But these things will break. In fact, they had a problem with these, uh, with the dealers back in the 70s when these, uh, when these things uh, first came out. The dealers would grind the cranks and they wouldn't harden them and they'd crack. So that's why it's so hard to get uh, undersized bearings for these things these days. Because eventually Jaguar said, okay, nobody grinds any crankshafts. You got to buy, either buy a good used one or buy a new one from us. And of course, at that point, all the manufacturers stopped, stopped making undersized bearings, except for 10,000s. You can get those. So anyway, bench full of crankshafts. Only one of them made the cut. One thing I failed to mention earlier was the nose of the crankshaft or the front end of the crankshaft. This is where you got the drive sprocket for the oil pump that goes on here and we've got a uh, collar which uh, seats against the main the front main seal here and up front here we've got this keyway for the harmonic balance. So when you're looking at your crankshaft to try to determine its condition you need to take a look at this see if there's burrs been raised along the edge, see if, it's, if the key weight or the key fits in there um, tightly. Also, you can see if there's any sort of chafing here at this end that would indicate that the harmonic balance has been loose. Um, also, another probably more important condition, and these first two crankshafts are two losers, don't have this problem, but our winner is kind of showing the beginnings of having the problem I'm talking about. What happens sometimes, particularly with cars up here in the northern climes where there's a lot of salt, uh, you can start to get salt water getting in between the harmonic balance and uh, the crankshaft and start to generate some pitting. If this gets severe enough, what you have to do is actually have it welded and reground. And that's not, that's not a cheap proposition, but if, um, if you don't do something about it, what can happen is that it can, over time, um, cause the harmonic balance to loosen up, and then you tear out the, the keyway that I pointed out here earlier, and tear that thing out, and now you gotta have it re-welded anyway, and another keyway put in. And that you gotta have done by somebody who really knows what they're doing. So, there's a lot to these things. They're great crankshafts, but if you're having them reconditioned, they've got to be done by somebody that's, that's got a good handle on what they're doing. Now, it must be said at this point that while the $100 Jaguar V12 overhaul might be the cheap way to build an engine, it's certainly not the fast or easy way. If you're going to do it fast and easy, you order up about $5,000 worth of parts and have the machine work done and then you sit down for three days or so and you put your engine together. Easy, fast. What we're doing here though requires that we go over to the shelves, take our used parts down, inspect them, figure out which ones are the best and those are the ones that go in the engine and that takes some time. A really good example of that is what we've got right here. 
we've got a set of four main bearings and a set and three sets of connecting rod bearings and another complete set of both. What I had to do is to take these bearings and individually measure them and uh, call them out and figure out which ones are going to be the winners. And those are them right there, the ones on the, the oven rack. What I did then is I coated these with our dry film lubricant process and I am every bit as confident that those are going to work out in that engine as I would with a brand new set of bearings. Over here we can see that we've got our cylinder liners all washed up in soap and water ready to go in and we've got our pistons. Uh, we've already shown you what the preparation of those looked like and I was at the point then where I was cutting these used piston rings to get the end gaps correct. Uh, these being ten thousandths over size, those liners being standard. And I got to looking at the outside of them and I got really worried that maybe these things aren't going to seat. And there's 12 sets of them. So the probability that one set isn't going to work out got me a little bit scared. This engine, after inspecting all these parts that we're putting into it, is going to be a pretty darn good engine. So I made the executive decision that we were going to put a new set of piston rings in it. Well, I went to my usual sources and I found that it was going to cost between $225 and $250 to buy a complete set of piston rings. Now that still would put us under $500, but I went to eBay. And wonder of wonders on eBay, I found a set of 12 cylinders worth of piston rings for $49. $49. That's the good news. The bad news is that one of the sets had a broken ring. The good news is, for whatever reason, I have no idea, I've got a complete set of 10,000 oversized rings for one cylinder. So, there we are, a complete set of piston rings for $49. Now when you find that on eBay, what are you going to do? Well, first of all, what you do is you offer the guy $35, which after I explained the situation, he took. So not only that, but he lives an hour and a half away from me. And not only that, he had a client that was dropping an engine off at his place. He sent the rings back with him and this guy lives about 15 minutes away from my house. Plus, when I opened the box, my $15 worth of shipping was in there. Sometimes life works like that. Not often, but sometimes. Putting the bearing shells in place after doing a bit of cleanup on the bottom end here. It's just a simple matter of finding the tab, finding the slot, and push them in place. Making sure that there is no dirt on the saddle underneath the bearing. Pretty simple. 